welcome to the AIM Research Video Podcast. I'm your host, Grant Collins, and as always, I have my good friend, Eric Basmajan with EPB Macro, and we're here to give you a third quarter outlook. Eric, how are you, sir? Doing well, Grant. It's been, uh, it's been an interesting time. Absolutely. There has been a lot that's happened since you and I talked at the second quarter, um, when we chatted offline, we purposely delayed this one just so we could get the GDP report out, just so we could get a little bit more information for our listeners today. And Eric, I'd, I'd like to go a different direction if we could. There's a lot of market narratives floating around that I think you and I can try to tackle for listeners. And I think there's four specifically. So one is, are we in a recession? A second one is inflation peaking or not. Uh, a third one is, will the Fed pivot? And then finally, has the market bottomed, right? Mm -hmm. I think if we can answer all four of those today, uh, our listeners should get a lot of value from our conversation. Yes. Uh, so let's kick it off right from the top. Okay. Eric, are, are we in recession? Okay. Uh, I know this is a hotly debated topic, and and I and I put some things out on Twitter, and I immediately got uh, uh, accused of being partisan for for my view because it's become a partisan talking point at this point but but no we're, we're not in a recession i think it's um i think it's undeniable I, I think it's pretty clear that we're not in a recession the the two quarters of negative gdp thing i totally understand however everyone is incorrect that is not the definition of a recession it has never been the definition of a recession it's a rule of thumb that started, I believe, in a 1974 New York Times article. So if the economy has two consecutive quarters, is the economy in a recession? No. Are all the recessions, do they all come with two consecutive negative quarters? Most of them, right? Almost all of them. We have a couple- makes it a good rule of thumb, right? It makes it a good rule of thumb. However, 2001, that recession, we did not have two consecutive negative quarters, but it was still considered a recession. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of an inconsistency there. 1947, we had two consecutive quarters of negative GDP, no recession. So clearly it's not the rule. Right. Why was it not a recession in 19 in 1947? The labor market was still strong and there were no job losses. Right. So for the economy to be in a recession, the, the real definition, and it's amazing because it's right on the NVER website. You can go there and you can look exactly at how they define these business cycle peaks and troughs. It's a widespread decline in economic activity lasting more than a few months spread across all sectors of the economy, including income, production, consumption, and employment, right? Right. We need to have a contraction in the growth rate of most of those sectors of the economy. And then if you actually read even further, the NBER website specifically says the two components that we look at most closely or we or we weight the heaviest are real income and non-farm payrolls, right? So, uh, you know, your, your listeners may know, uh, the people that have listened to our calls before, if you could see my screen here, that, that mm -hmm. I track these exact coincident indicators that are on the NBER website that define recession for a very specific reason. And when we look at these indicators, they're all decelerating. The growth rate of all of them is coming down, but none of them, zero, are below zero. Zero are contracting. And for there to be a recession, most of these have to be below zero. And the two that are weighted most heavily are on the right-hand side, non-farm payrolls and, and uh, real personal uh, income, excluding transfer payments. And as all your listeners know, I combine these four indicators into one composite coincident indicator so we can track this as one, one basket. And here it is. The trending direction of all four corners of the economy is still 2.3% as of the June update. It's actually still above the long-term average. Mm -hmm. Now, long-winded answer. Why is GDP contracted? So uh, I'm fully in the camp that the growth rate has been slowing in the economy. You and I both know that uh, I've been in the deceleration camp for quite some time. I believe the deceleration and growth will continue, which is the most important point. But if we look at the GDP report, there was a massive increase in inventory in Q3 and Q4 of last year. Mm -hmm. Inventory over the long term contributes nothing to economic growth. If you take like the 10-year average of inventory, it nets out to basically exactly zero. So whenever there are huge inventory builds, it adds to growth. But then a couple quarters later, you have huge inventory draws and it subtracts from growth. 
So Q3 and Q4 of 2021, we had huge inventory builds because of this big durable goods push that we had after COVID. And all that happened in Q1 and Q2 was we had massive inventory draws. I think in the Q2 GDP report, inventory subtracted over 2% from, from the headline index. So real final sales was actually still positive. Now, I'm not saying that the growth rate was strong. I'm not saying that the economy is doing well, but based on the facts of are we in a recession or not, the data is right here in front of us. Um, we, have to, we have to basically be below zero on this index for there to be a recession. Now, last caveat before I pass it over to you. Yeah. As we'll get to in some of the, the later questions, I believe that the economy is going to continue to slow over the next couple of quarters and that the coincident indicators that I just presented and the composite on this chart here will fall below zero. So I do believe the economy will slip into a recession. And if that does happen, I believe that the recession start date will be backdated to roughly you know Q1 or Q2, uh, most likely Q2. Uh, I would say, but with the data in hand today, barring any major revisions, the economy's not in a recession right now. Yeah, no, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, I'm in that exact same camp. So I'm going to uh, take this over from you and then maybe add a couple different nuances to this. Um, so to your point, you know, you and I probably have a different trend component on each of these. Um, I use what we call an HP filter. It separates the actual data uh, into both a trend and a cyclical component. Mm -hmm. uh, and essentially what we're looking at here uh, on a 1990 trend, really the only one is income that's below trend, mm -hmm. right? When, you, when yep. you look at consumption, it's back to trend, but it's not yep. falling through trend. Totally. Production still elevated and employment is still elevated. And that is what's keeping GDP on trend despite this slowdown. Mm -hmm. What I've been looking at differently is, you know, is this a situation where we just fall to trend or do we officially fall below and even much further into that recessionary environment? I was in the camp that I was seeing that we were going to fall to trend. I'm now seeing much different data that says, hey, we're going to go much below that. And, and I want to highlight John Hicks, who's a British economist who's done extremely good work in trade cycle. And Hicks believed that you had an upper and a lower barrier to economic growth. Uh, the upper barrier should make a lot of sense. It's full employment. You can't produce more than the workforce that you have available. Uh, the lower barrier is a little bit more abstract, a little bit more complex. Hicks believed that there was an autonomous level of investment in the economy. Mm -hmm. That no matter what, you're going to have structures that deteriorate, you're going to have machines or equipment that needs to be repaired or replaced. And that autonomous level of investment or that continual investment acts as a floor for the economy. As you're seeing here, this chart is very, very busy. So I added the keys on the lower left hand side. Um, the black line is the OECD leading economic indicators. Uh, so you can see that as of the most recent update of OECD, we're going through the floor of economic growth. We're going through that autonomous level of investment. I've also added our forecast for real GDP on top of this as well. Uh, and you can see that it's really close to the lower forecasted estimate shaded in like a little darker blue or a darker gray there. Right. So we really have to then ask ourselves, okay, well, what is going to get us out of this recession and how deep is it going to be and how long is it going to be? Uh, I'm in the camp that it depends on the level of investments that actually get made along the way here. We had a significant amount of investments that were made during COVID. We're going to have to have another similar wave to get a secondary start here to the recession or to get us out of the recession. I'm sorry. Um, the other side of it is, you know, if, if you just look at the OECD components, um, they're not all trending lower, mm -hmm. uh, which is another reason why we're not in a full-blown recession just yet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, housing starts have come below trend, and you can see the cyclical component on the right. Uh, if, if you're looking just here briefly, and I'm actually just going to I'm going to pull a pin in here real quick. You know, where it's at right now is nowhere near the COVID recession or the 08 recession or yep. even some of the recessions that we've seen in the 80s or the 70s, right? So we're not in a recessionary level and housing starts, even though it's been deteriorating significantly. Yep. 
durable goods orders are still significantly strong, uh, which blows my mind. I think even Eric, when they came out, I sent you a note that said, wow, you know, they're still yeah. holding up. Uh, and we're not even seeing either the trend or the cyclical component rolling over just yet. Mm -hmm. Consumer confidence is at recessionary levels. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that left-hand chart is pretty extreme. Yeah, we are very much there. The trend is directionally lower and at, at extreme levels that go back to, you know, 08 uh, and even in the 90s and even in the 80s. And that fits with the concept that your real income metric was the only one that's below trend, right? That's, exactly. that's, the, that's how people feel, real income. Exactly. Uh, the last one here is uh, weekly hours worked. Uh, you know, we've seen that uh, roll over, uh, but we've not actually seen it break trend too much here. It's mm -hmm. holding so far, but the employment's kind of the, the last leg of this chain, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're kind of waiting for the employment side of things. But, you know, Eric, I'm, I'm right there with you. I, I don't see a recession as it is today, but what I do see is the leading economic indicators are breaking down further. Yep. Uh, we will, looks like it's going to go through the floor of this autonomous level of investment. Um, and then the question is, is it going to be more mild or is it going to be more severe? Mm -hmm. I believe you probably need another shock somewhere for it to be very severe, or at least that's the camp I'm in right now. Right. Yep. I, I agree with you. I'm just going to piggyback on a couple of those points. You know, people always ask me, you know, how much or how severe or how much are earnings going to decline? And, and I always say that getting the direction is hard enough, right? You know, and, and the primary focus is always on the direction. Are we going to continue decelerating or are we going to inflect higher? Magnitude is, is secondary and by a long shot. And the reason for that is because, as you just said, uh, what determines the magnitude is largely dependent on what shocks come during the deceleration. And, and those are largely unknowable, right? The other thing that's that's difficult to forecast is the duration. So people say, how long are we going to be in a recession? And in my framework, I use a coincident indicator, as I just showed, to define the trend. But then I use a sequence of leading indicators to tell me where we're going. And the best leading indicators that I know of only can see out two to three quarters, Right. Maybe, maybe you can get 10 or 11, 12 months on, on some of the best leading indicators, but it's, it's a little fuzzy when you get out that far. So uh, as far as forecasting duration, we can't sit here and say that we're going to be in a slowdown for the next two years, at least in my process. All I can do is give a, a series of rolling two to three quarter forecasts. Right. 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 And, and based on what I'm seeing right now, and the reason that I'm uh, in the recessionary camp is because I believe that growth has slowed to trend based on most metrics through trend on, on a lot of the more cyclical metrics and the leading indicators that I'm looking at, uh, some of which you just showed, aren't showing any bottom at all. So therefore, the next two to three quarters, the economy has an extremely high probability of continuing to decelerate. Uh, and, and that's likely to put us below zero. Now, the question of magnitude is is very difficult to answer because, um, you know, the, we don't know what shocks are going to come. Um, I use my, my secular economic trends and, and those secular trends are the debt and demographics to, to give me a, a bias on the level of magnitude. And my bias is that the slowdown or coming recession is likely to be a little more severe than people are anticipating because, the structural forces in the economy are so weak. And what I mean by that is the demographics, which we've talked about uh, quite a bit, are, are deteriorating everywhere around the world. Um, they're, they're not great in the United States, but they're a lot better than everywhere else. So there's no clear engine of economic growth around the world as it pertains to demographics. The China engine of growth, which supported the global economy the last 15 years really, is, is largely over, I believe. And the debt levels in all major countries are at record levels. Um, so when you when you whenever you have a record debt level situation, uh, to me that just tilts the scales towards the the more uh, extreme, especially when you engage in the most rapid tightening cycle in in forty years. So we have a very very extreme monetary tightening, and we have a record level of debt, and that's not. You know, those aren't tools to forecast the next couple of quarters, 
But as far as, you know, what's in the back of my mind, that's not a healthy combination generally. So uh, my, my, my view is that we're just going to continue to decelerate. That's my main forecast. I would, I would have to be tilted towards the more severe camp just based on that secular backdrop. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good point. And, and one that I'm going to echo with uh, pulling that chart up of Hicks trade cycle theory. Um, this is something that needs to be tested and there needs to be more empirical analysis done. Um, but Hicks believe that the magnitude of the fall can be dictated by the magnitude of the previous recovery. Mm -hmm. and you can kind of see it here based on the you know, oscillations between growth of the floor and the ceiling. You know, if you go back and maybe even look at like the seventies and how we went well above the maximum capacity yeah, yeah. of the economy and we literally ripped back below it. And when we recovered, we went right back up. And that's kind of his interpretation of, look, the duration could be the oscillation of the previous cycle as you just continue to move in magnitude further and further along. Yep. Um, so I don't try to necessarily uh, get the, the duration either. I do forecast out, you know, four to six quarters just to get a general directional trend going forward from here. And you can see that it might potentially begin to turn the corner in potentially Q1, Q2. Uh, it looks like we're going to continue to slow for the rest of the year, at least on my forecasted estimate. But with both of us having that same similar outlook that, you know, recession is all but here, right? It's, right. it's starting to basically the cracks are there and um, we just need a few more data points to come through to basically tip the scales. Exactly. Let's answer the next market narrative of will the pet the Fed pivot? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll, I'll I'll take that one first, and um, I think that first we have to define pivot, right? And and that's part of the the dilemma here is that people think like if they stop raising rates, that's a pivot. Um, I don't think so. I don't think that's a pivot. Um, to me, a pivot is cutting rates and quantitative easing, right? Mm -hmm. That's a pivot. Um, so I don't think that the Fed is going to pivot um, in the next six months, right? I don't think that they're going to pivot by by the end of the year. Um, and I think that before they pivot, they're going to pause, right? I think that the pause is going to come sooner than people think. Um, so I, I think that um, by the time we get to year end, I think that the employment numbers, as, as far as we're playing out this economic sequence, I think by the time we get to year end, the employment numbers will look rather ugly and the recession will be most likely fully here. And I think the Fed will be reluctant to continue tightening when employment numbers are perhaps printing negative, let's say, as a hypothetical. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that at that point, the Fed will stop raising interest rates. When we print negative job numbers, I think that the market will force the Fed at that point to stop raising rates. Now, they've gotten rates to two and a half. They're going to raise maybe another 50 in September. They'll be at three. I think most people believe that, that that's a restrictive stance. So if they stop at three, let's say, I don't think that that's a pivot, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, and, then, and then if they cut 50 basis points throughout all of 2023, which is, I believe, what's roughly priced in now into Fed Funds futures, that still gets you to two and a half, which is still, quote unquote, the neutral level in, in most people's minds. So I think what the market's pricing in now is they're going to raise rates to, to three, 325 by year end, and then they're going to cut 50 or 75 back to 250. Um, quantitative uh, tightening will still be running in the background. Uh, there's no indication that they would stop that. Um, so I don't think that that would classify, at least in my view, as a, as a pivot, right? I think what, you know, a, a real pivot is, you know, they're cutting rates way back below uh, neutral, close to zero. They're starting quantitative easing because the economy is in a really bad way. And I think that the bar to do that is quite high. And um, so, so I think that, you know, the language around pivot has to be specific. And I, I do think that the Fed will stop raising rates sooner than what the market's pricing in, which I believe is roughly around January or December. Mm -hmm. Market, as last I looked, was pricing about 350. I don't think that they're going to get to 350. So I think that they're going to stop um, 
you know, I think maybe September, maybe the last one that they get off 50 or 75, that'll put us at three to 325. I think that's likely as far as they get, and then they'd be inclined to stay there and wait. But I still believe that that's going to be a restrictive policy stance that continues to push the economy in a deceleration or, or, or downward direction. So, um, uh, you know, I don't think that a, a pivot is in store uh, before, you know, Q1 of 2023 or, or even the midpoint of 2023, um, despite uh, how I believe that we are going to go into a recession. So, yeah, no, I'm, I think that's a really, really good point is that we have to make that distinction between pivot and pause. I'm, I'm going to jump down here to a, a couple of slides here to give you an idea of what I'm thinking. Um, so first, we can just kind of view it from just what the market has been interpreting their rate it, hikes. It is, a great, it is a great chart. So we really are still waiting for the Fed to meet expectations, mm -hmm. right? The market's been here for quite some time, for quite a while. Yep. And what's interesting is that if you're going to get a pivot, this is also a really good chart to show you the sequence of the pivot as well. Mm -hmm. You can look back to the last tightening cycle and you saw the two-year rollover hard. Yep. Then you saw the one-month rollover later. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, when we actually take that spread, uh, the two year minus the one month, as soon as it goes negative, that's when the Fed pauses. Yep. It, uh, exactly. It, hap it happened in March of 19, it happened in August of 06. So you can see over here on the right, we're just now getting that deceleration in the two year minus one month spread. Exactly. And, and I think that, and that's where the basis of my, my, feeling that that they're not going to get all that much past three is because when we look at the two year today, it's it's kind of struggling to get back above three. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's kind of holding it's kind of holding at that three level, despite the fact that, you know, I, I look at, you know, the Euro dollar futures curve. Uh Euro dollar futures curve is pricing in 350. Yeah. Uh by December, but the two years holding at three. So which is why I think that three level is kind of at least at this moment where the market's saying, OK, I don't know if you're going to get too much past here. Um, and I believe that the economy is going to decelerate sharply over the next several months. So I think that the tendency for the two year to to hold or press lower and sort of push back on some of those expectations to have this line in your chart, this blue line come down hard mm -hmm. is, is going to be there over the next couple of months. Yeah, especially if the Fed continues ramping the short end. Exactly. They were exactly. very, very clear and very, very adamant about saying, look, the June SEP uh, forecast is probably your best guess of where we're going to go next, right? And mm -hmm. Jerome Powell told us specifically in, in answering questions. So we're right here at two and a quarter, two and a half. If we look at their projections and just look at the median, you're at three and a half. Mm -hmm. You know, so that to your point, maybe 75 at the next one, maybe 50 at the end of the year, right? And, those, yeah. And you're there, right? Exactly. And you're pretty well done. Um, but you and I both know that brings us to like our next market narrative question. Mm -hmm. Has inflation peaked? Right. Now, before I hand it to you, I'm still in the camp that it's going to be extremely sticky, mm -hmm. which is what makes this Fed tightening cycle a little bit harder to um, follow, forecast, what have you, right? We're going to get the economy to decelerate. But is that going to be enough to actually drag the inflation rate lower right. whenever you've got a lot like baked into the cake, right? Mm -hmm. So a yeah. couple couple things that I'm looking at on inflation, just to get your thoughts here. So just first and foremost, the inflation gap in general, right? So we're now at a 9.1 CPI. Um, I'm probably going to misremember the PCE, but 6163, something, something along yep. those lines. Yep. Um, we're still well above the 2% target, which Eric, you and I offline, I argued that, you know, Hey, there could be a situation where they move that target floor, but Jerome Powell came out and was very specific and said, no, we're going to get back to two. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's what gives me some pause because that's a, that's a lot of deceleration that has to happen. Yep. We've seen some of it, but we've also seen some sticky inflation too. So yep. where have we seen things decelerate? We've seen it in goods inflation yep you've seen it accelerate on the back end on the service side though so it's been yep. a handoff here yep 
we've then also seen it in kind of prices paid both on kind of the ism survey data but then also huge, huge declines on both services and and manufacturing yeah and then even when you get into the fed survey data in new york mm -hmm. dallas and the fed you've seen right. it all over what remains somewhat sticky though and something and I, and I would add one more thing sorry to interrupt is is commodity price inflation has has eased significantly right so we yes. have the we have the industrials uh, you know, that things like lumber, things like copper, they've come down 30, 40%. And as we're recording this today, oil dropped to about 88 yep, down yep. from 120. So we have, um, uh, I have a composite that I, that I track of all commodity prices, both exchange traded and then some lesser traded like rosin, rubber, things like that. And um, it hasn't quite fully flipped into deflation as in a negative growth rate. But it's the lowest growth rate that we've had since the COVID, uh, uh, since the COVID uh, rebound. So I think that the commodity price inflation, which was a significant driver, uh, has rolled over uh, pretty sharply, um, and the durables has rolled over pretty sharply as well. Yeah. So th that's, I guess, the bright spot of the inflation conversation. Uh, something that I think is lingering in the background is wage inflation. Mm -hmm. Um, so here's my kind of take on, on wage inflation. So there's a couple lines on here. The yellow line is the actual CPI inflation rate. Uh, the green line is the compensation of employees, wages, and salaries from GDI. Uh, the blue line that you're seeing there is this ratio between job leavers and the actual unemployment level. And I, and I want to unpack that with you here a little bit, Eric. The, the reason why I've, I've put this on here is if you can think about it intuitively, if the job leavers or the quits rate is elevated while the unemployment rate is very low, that intuitively leads to, hey, there's probably a lot of jobs open and available in the economy. That means there's a lot of labor demand, which means laborers have negotiating power. If you do it on the flip side, if you have a very, very low quits rate, but a high unemployment rate, you get the complete opposite. There's probably not very many job openings. There's not a lot of demand for workers. So therefore they don't have that negotiating power. Yep. This seems very sticky to me. And one of the things that from, you know, from an economist perspective is um, I think Keynes got it right. Uh, you know, wages and prices are very, very sticky and they're also very contractually based. Right. So mm -hmm. as people get pay raises, I believe you're going to stick some level of this inflation in the system, and it's going to make it really difficult to get down right. to 2%. Um, what are your thoughts, Eric, then? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, we'll have a good, we'll have a disagreement on one element. So keep your screen up because you had yeah. some, you had yeah. some good charts. If you can go back to um, the first chart you had with the, with the line at about two and a half percent inflation. So, you know, again, everything that I do is leading indicators and a sequence of economic events. And as you could see in this chart, inflation regularly peaks in the middle of recessions, mm. right? So if we just talked about in the first part of this call that we haven't fully hit the recession yet, it's not an historical anomaly that inflation hasn't come down yet. We need to be actually starting the recession or in the recession for inflation to come down. Uh, and I think that that's going to happen over the next couple of months. So I think that we are in the vicinity of a peak in inflation. And I think some of the internal components are, are proving that, like the commodity prices, like we just said. And then if you go to your next chart, the services versus durables, mm -hmm. the durables always peaks very early. You look at 1995. Uh, through 2000, decelerated hard. You look at 2005, 2010, decelerated. Now it's coming down again. And what's the component that peaks in the recession? It's the services, right? And why does that happen? It's because in the economic sequence, if we look at growth, leading indicators are housing, durable goods, your, your industrially sensitive sectors of the uh uh, of the economy and the more coincident to lagging indicators are your services, your employment and things like that. So I think that these components are sticky just from where they come in the economic sequence. So I think it's very, very natural that we're going to see durables come down sharply. We're going to see commodities come down sharply and we're going to see services rise. It's nothing more than the predictable pattern. And if you look at like 1980, mm -hmm. it peaked after the recession, the services component, right? You look at 1990, it peaked in like the last month of the recession. So I think this is very, very normal. And, and, um, uh, 
So what I would expect to unfold over the next several months is I think that we're going to have a sharp deceleration in durable goods inflation, likely going all the way to deflation. I think that the commodity component will continue to come down, led by the industrials, lagged by oil, because oil is more services based. Mm -hmm. As that comes down, that'll pull the, the commodity price is down. And then services inflation, I think, will continue to rise into and even through the middle of the recession. And then ultimately, it'll, it'll come down uh, as we get to the middle and end of recession because you need job losses to come down. Right. Because what is drives the services? Mostly rent, right? Mostly housing. Yep. And, and, and that's going to be, quote unquote, sticky until the job losses start. So where I come out on this is, you know, it's been a fool's errand to pick the top in inflation because there's been a lot of extraneous factors. But as far as the sequence, this is all very uh, much consistent, led by durables, led by uh, industrial commodities, you know, then led a little bit later by the uh, oil. Um, and uh, I, I believe that, that those components are going to lead the deceleration of inflation. Uh, and then as we get into the middle of the recession, which may not be until the very, very end of the year, probably in Q1 of 2023, uh, then you'll start to see the services component peak. And then it'll be after the recession, as you could see in the chart, that the services component really starts to come down. So um, I think that we're in the vicinity. We can see the gears turning of the peak in inflation. Uh, the question of how rapidly it comes back to 2% will largely be a function of one, what shocks hit the economy, because it'll be somewhat commensurate with the severity of the recession. Mm -hmm. If you have a very mild recession, it'll come down a little slower. If you have a 2008 style recession, it's going to come down really fast. Right. Um, I, I don't I don't necessarily think that's going to happen uh, a 2008 style recession, just making the point that the magnitude of the decline in, in the economy will will filter through the magnitude of the decline in, in, in the inflation rate. Um, so so yeah, I think that that's the sequence of which is going to play out. So over the next couple of months, if we see commodity prices continue to stay soft and we see the durable goods components of the inflation and the cyclical components of inflation come down, that'll be a sign that we are at the peak of inflation. And the services component, I do not expect to come down until you're at the middle or even the end of the recession. Um, the other thing that I would look at is inflation expectations. Mm -hmm. Uh you know, I, I've never been a huge fan of like the Michigan sentiment surveys and, and things like that. I know that the Fed looks at them or, or they claim to look at them. But if you look at something like five year, five year forward uh, inflation expectations, uh, they've come off from their peak quite a bit. And they, they ticked up after the um, market thought that uh, Powell was dovish at his last press conference. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I would say that uh, if the commodity prices come down, the durable goods inflation comes down, the inflation expectations come down, that's that's pretty much the evidence that you need for the peak. Services will always lag as they do in, in the chart here. So that, that's that's my take on the inflation uh, story. Yeah, no, spot on. That's That was yeah. a, a great explainer of really what we should be seeing it hopefully within uh, the next few months if we're moving into that recession environment. Yeah. So um, that brings us really to kind of the last market narrative, right? Because, you know, if the the inflation, let's say it does stay a little sticky and by year end, you get closer to seven or six on the, the CPI yep. uh, and the Fed keeps raising rates, um, that's still tightening on the financial sector and on the financial economy. Uh, has the market bottomed? Yeah, so I, I don't think so. Um, and, and the reason is because in my framework, uh, I would I would generally air bearish of risk assets until the economy accelerates. As long as the economy is decelerating, I think that the probability that the market makes a new low is still there. Um, and the economy is not going to accelerate in the next couple of months, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and part of the reason we know that is because the leading indicators – not only have they, uh, you know, not turned up, they're hitting new lows, yep. right? So, so that gives me a, a, a reasonable degree of confidence that the next couple of quarters, we're going to see continued decelerations in economic growth. And I think that it would be historically very inconsistent for the market to bottom um, three or four quarters before the economy bottoms. Generally, from historical standpoint, stocks are considered a short leading indicator, and what that means is stock prices generally bottom one to three months before uh, the economy bottoms or one to three months before coincident data bottoms. 
And given that our leading indicators haven't declined at, or haven't turned up at all, that gives us a high degree of confidence that the economy is going to continue to slow over the next two to three quarters, mm -hmm. right? Uh, now, the severity of that slowdown is in question, but if the economy is going to slow for two to three quarters, uh, you know, which is, you know, somewhere in the in the vicinity of, of, of six to eight months, let's say, uh, or even say four to six months, that would be uh, historically very inconsistent for the stock market to, market to bottom that much ahead of the economy bottoming. So, so just based on the way that the historical sequence plays out, uh, I'm inclined to think that the market has not bottomed simply on the fact that the economy, in my view, is not uh, has not bottomed and is not two to three quarters away from bottoming. Yeah, no. And to piggyback off of that, um, I'm, I'm going to show you a chart of the S&P 500 drawdowns during recessions, because mm -hmm. I, I think this probably brings your point home a little bit, because um, I'm also in the camp that if you're moving into recession, since the OECD leading economic indicators are through Hicks's autonomous level of investment and point to a recessionary decline in growth, then we have to expect that the stock market's not quite done. Mm -hmm. um, so if we look at just normal uh, sell-offs during recessionary periods, right? So I'm going to highlight a couple of them here um, and then read you some stats um, here, 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 here here and here. Um, the normal average drawdown from this 1965 to 2020 period, uh, 2022 period, I'm sorry, is minus 14.19%. However, during recessions, the average decline is minus 34%. Mm. So, you know, you would have to make the argument that we're not moving into recession exactly. to exactly. declare this as bottomed. Exactly. Right. And so, you know, the other thing is, you know, we are seeing kind of leaders shift a little bit here, right? I mean, what's been interesting is for the longest time that I've, I've shown you these charts on our calls, um, you know, it's been defensive, dividend payers, low volatility yeah. and value, but you're starting to see small caps, which were very, very aggressive, kind of creep into there. Uh, you're starting to see things like higher beta start to come up as well as growth in the triple Qs. Yep. Um, so it's really interesting to see where investors are beginning to allocate on this rally. They really are truly uh, jumping into the risk pool, uh, which yeah. has gotten hit a lot, right? I mean, they were down close to 30% yeah. coming into this thing. I, I have a comment on that. Um, so, so, so my comment there is that those sectors – high beta, small cap, and um, I would say crappy tech. Mm. Um, they're all basically long duration, expressions of long duration risk assets. And the reason that those declined first and, and hardest is because interest rates were rising, right? So if interest rates are rising, the longest duration type assets, you think like maybe like cryptocurrency would be like the the, the uberest long duration asset. Right. Um, those will decline in value really strongly. And when the economy goes into a recession, credit spreads widen or risk premiums widen and you get a divergence between stocks and bonds, right? The reason that we haven't had a divergence between stocks and bonds is because the Fed's been raising interest rates, rates have been going up, but you're not getting that widening of risk premium because the economy's not in a recession. Mm -hmm. What you have is stocks and long duration assets sort of trading one for one. And Given your your view and my view that we're not in a recession yet, and the market is still toggling with this soft landing view, which is admittedly fair, we're not in a recession yet. It's just our opinion that we're going to continue to decelerate. Other people can have a different opinion. Um, we've seen rates come down almost 100 basis points. Right. The 10-year was at 350. It printed like 260, 265. So 100 basis points decline in, in, in risk-free rate, but no recession has to give you a reflexive bid for anything that's an expression of a long duration asset. And, and that's your high beta, your crappy tech, your small caps, all the stuff that was hit when rates were going up. So I think that all that's happened here in the market is we have this reflexive duration uh, bid without a widening of risk premiums. So what's going to happen, in my view, is that if the economy does go into a recession, the rates are going to hold where they are and start to come down, treasury rates, 
but you're going to see the credit spreads wide and you're going to see the risk premiums widen. And, and that's going to, to uh, flip this divergence that we, or, or lack of divergence that we've had between bonds and, and stocks. And that's when you'll start to see, you know, uh, your, your small caps going down when the rates are coming down. But if the economy believes that we're in a, we're going to have a soft landing, it's not going to widen those risk premiums. And then stocks and bonds are going to trade in a very one for one type type pattern. And, you know, I, I always, I, I joke with clients that, that, uh, that send me a message and tell me about the bear market rally. Uh, I'm like, you mean bonds or stocks? Because <laughs> stocks are up 14%, but uh, last I checked, long duration bonds like the EDVs and the TLTs of the world were up were up 12 to 13% also, yeah. right? So again, it's this one for one pattern. And the way that that, that correlation is gonna break and flip to the historical negative correlation that people are used to is an actual recession where the risk premiums start to widen out. So. Uh, that that's my take on why we've seen that rotation into some of the sectors that were leading to the downside now leading to the upside. Yeah, you extremely well put. Um, with that being said, um, you know the overall market implications, at least in my opinion, is you still have to remain defensive, right? If I could go back to those uh, slides here just real quickly, I, I've been in the camp that when you're in an environment where the the growth rate of the economy is slowing down, uh, you have to be in this kind of upper left hand quadrant where you're trying to make sure that you're taking totally. below average risk, but yet above average return. Totally. And when you look at those, it's your dividend payers, it's your defensive, it's your value, it's your low volatility. And then when you dig into the individual sectors, uh, it's been healthcare, it's been utilities, it's yep. been state. Those are your three classics, right? Yeah. Um, industrials uh, hanging out there. Uh, I think I think those are on their way out. Yeah. Uh, and then when yeah. you get into the fixed income side, I think it's a little bit changed because of these rate moves. But for the longest time, it was just cash. Yeah, um, right, right, right. But now that we have seen these rate moves, you're starting to see like the seven to 10 year treasury creep in here. You're starting to see some international bonds kind of creep in here here um you know tips are kind of falling down and then investment grade corporates are still in that category as well um what you just mentioned the ED, edv and tlt uh have yet to really move uh above those but i'm i'm like you i would imagine we were going to get there uh whenever the inflation or i'm sorry whenever the recession sets in uh, mm -hmm. and the fed does uh, officially pause right i bet that will come at the pause at that point exactly that, that's what i believe yeah. So, uh, Eric, I think we knocked out what I believe are the four narratives that are running. Yeah, right I, I think so. I think so. Um, so just a quick uh, summarization of all four of those. Um, you and I both believe that we're still kind of in this growth slowdown period that is going to eventually lead to that recessionary environment, mm -hmm. which will likely end up make the uh, inflation rate peak out. Mm -hmm. It'll make the Fed pivot, and that will also uh, unfortunately mean more downside in the financial market uh, until that pivot actually comes, which I don't want to put words in your mouth, um, at least from my perspective, it's going to come probably at the end of the year or until the two year is actually yielding below the one month. I think so. You know, two year minus Fed funds, something like that is, is a general proxy. I think that comes around around year end. And, and again, I think that we we pause before we pivot. Yeah. Yeah. The duration, and the duration of that pause is very important here because, you know, if they get rates to three, let's say, and then they pause for six months because inflation hasn't come down, that's going to be a very restrictive stance on an economy that's in a recession for quite some time. So uh, we have to differentiate pause versus pivot. To me, pivot is flooring rates to zero and quantitative easing. A pause is hanging out above neutral for argument's sake, let's call it two, two and a half percent. So, you know, if, if they're, if they're holding rates above two and a, uh, two and a half percent, you know, if they get to three and then they cut, you know, 50 basis points and they hold there, that's, that's a pause, I would say. Yeah. And let's not forget that, you know, everybody was talking about how Jerome Powell removed forward guidance. And I didn't really believe that in his conversation. I think he gave you all the guidance in the world. Mm -hmm. Not only did he tell you that you can look at the SEPs for their projection of rate hikes going forward, but he said, look, it's highly likely that we're going to have to have growth below trend for some time. Right, right. Just because you go through it, 
is not some time. Like the yeah. severity might make him change. That shock that you and I are talking about that we have no right. way of determining what that is. Exactly. That could make him pivot. But if we just have this gradual deceleration in growth that let's call it controllable, mm-hmm. so to speak, he's going to allow that to happen because it will bring that inflation rate down. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, to me, that also leads to, unfortunately, more tighter financial conditions mm-hmm. and more pressure on, on the stock market going forward from here. Yep, I think we're in the same camp. So any last words, Eric, before we uh, sign off here? No, I think I think we did a good job and hit the major questions. I'm sure we'll have four brand new ones in a couple of months, but we'll we'll tackle those when we get them. That's that's what make Finn twit so so interesting. <laughs> yeah, right. There's there's always new new things to uncover and unpack. Exactly. Eric, I always appreciate these quarterly outlooks. You bring a obviously a unique framework and uh, you really, really dig into the data and you can genuinely tell how passionate you are about it. So I greatly appreciate your time. Thank you for being on uh, and look forward to having you again in Q4. Yeah. Love to do it.